The resurrection of our Lord Jesus was the sign that heaven had accepted the justification of the world that took place on the cross. I'm reading to you from the last verse of Romans chapter 4. Jesus our Lord was put to death for our trespasses and raised for our justification. Dear friend, the word for usually means because of, so we could translate it this way. He was put to death because of our trespasses, but he was raised because of our justification. His resurrection was the sign that justification for the world had been accomplished. Notice how the words that follow continue the theme in chapter 5. Therefore, since we are justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him we have obtained access to this grace in which we stand. And we rejoice in our hope of sharing the glory of God. More than that, we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character. Character produces hope. And hope doesn't disappoint us, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit, which has been given to us. Please consider what it's saying. It's as though we've been ushered into a huge room, packed with gold ingots, rubies and diamonds and topazes and amethysts. By grace we have access to the treasure. And now our energies are aroused. Remember that Clive of India was taken by a prince into a treasure house and told to help himself. He only took a very little, but when he got back to England he was on trial. And in defence he said, I am surprised at my own moderation. Now my friends, the law in the Christian life is, according to your faith be it unto you. Salvation is for little faith as well as great heart. But you can travel first, second or third class in the Christian life. Great faith, great blessing. Smaller faith, smaller blessings. Little faith, apart from the great gift, the accessories are little. According to your faith, be it unto you. So here the Apostle is saying, by grace you have access to all the treasures. Select them well. Take a big bag. But he also tells us that despite the fact we're Christians, there will be sufferings. But he says we can rejoice in our sufferings. I'm not at all prone to rejoice in my sufferings. I hate them. I would swim through a sewer to avoid pain. But somehow I've got to grow, realising that all my sufferings are permitted by God to make me more like his son, so that glory ultimately will be the more glorious. He's made us his diamonds. Now he's going to polish us. We shouldn't be afraid of trouble, though we all are. We've got to learn to trust God where we cannot trace him. Remember it's written in scriptures that Moses drew near the thick darkness where God was. That's at the end of Exodus 19. God is where the darkness is. Clouds and darkness around about his throne. Isaiah talks about the treasures of darkness. God doesn't fool us. If becoming a Christian meant we'd escape all trouble, who wouldn't become one? The church would be destroyed overnight. It's like healings. Everyone expects to be healed if they're a Christian. If being a Christian meant that every sickness was healed, who wouldn't become a Christian overnight? Destroy the church. You are God's child and your education is undertaken by the best teachers and pain is the best teacher. But the rewards are magnificent, the treasures of darkness. Weeping may endure for a night, joy cometh in the morning. Whenever you're in trouble, remember the words of Christ. What I do thou knowest not now, but thou shalt know hereafter. Remember he has said, I give you power over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. No permanent hurt, not even death. It's not permanent. It's only asleep. Fifty times it's called asleep. Christ has abolished death. 
when Christ, who is our life, shall appear, we'll appear with him in glory. But there are many deaths on the way to death. Every sickness is a mini death. Every trial is a mini death. They're meant to throw us in dependence on God. We breathe best the spiritual air of heaven when we know we need him. Constant sunshine makes a desert. God won't have spoiled children, and yet in a sense we're all spoiled. So note the words again. We rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. Dear friend, we couldn't live without hope. Many of our hopes are false hopes. We keep going after disappointment and disillusionment because of hope. But the realisation really matches the anticipation. Only in things spiritual will the reality match the promise. Most things in life are like a fish on the end of the, the line. As you're tugging, you think it's a real whopper. When you pull it in, it's not that big. Sometimes you've just got a lot of seaweed. The blessings of earth are very limited. It's the blessings of eternity that count most. Here we're training. This life's a school for character. And so, Paul says, hope in your sufferings. Hope. Because there's glory to come. And he says, if you will meet suffering in the right way, the love of God will be shed abroad in your hearts by the Holy Spirit who is given unto us. This is the beginning of the emphasis on the Spirit. Soon we're coming to this chapters on sanctification. So it's introduced here. He's the sanctifier. Remember, Christ for us, that's the Christian message. Christ in us, that's the Christian life. Christ for us, that's justification. Christ in us, that's sanctification. Distinguish, but don't separate the work of the Son and the Spirit. Did you notice it says the love of God is poured into our hearts? That's not our love for God, that's God's love for us. Remember, no one loves God until convinced that God loves them. It goes on to tell us more. Verse 8, God shows his love for us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That's a mouthful. While we were yet sinners, put with that verse 10. If while we were enemies we were reconciled to God by the death of his Son. Notice, while we were enemies we were reconciled. The whole world was reconciled to the cross. Not everybody knows. This is the Christian task. Go and tell them. God has dealt with your sin. He's reconciled to you if you'll accept it. If while we were enemies we were reconciled. Back earlier, while we were sinners. See, the lamb for the Israelites wasn't first slain in Canaan. It was slain in Egypt while they were slaves. And Christ, our Passover, died while we were yet sinners, while we were yet enemies. So the good news is it's been done. We are reconciled. The barrier is down. The veil's been torn. Whosoever will may come. That's the demonstration of the love of God. Verse 11, not only so, we rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Christians know that evil's a reality, but it's not absolute. It's only temporary. As we said, weeping endures for a night. Nightmares never last. As Robert Schuller says, tough times don't last, but tough people do. Faith can make you tough. Now notice that salvation, righteousness, is called the free gift five times. I'm not going to read all the verses, but you can. In verses 15 down to 17. I'm going to read verse 17. If because of one man's trespass, death reigned through that one man, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. As one man's trespass led to condemnation for all men, so one man's act of righteousness leads to acquittal and life for all men. Oh, my friends, how precious the words. What's God up to when he talks about a free gift? All gifts are free. Is he pulling our leg? Why a free gift? God is saying, listen, stupid, it is a freebie. Believe me, it really, truly is free. It's a freebie. It's a free-free. Take it. Take it. 
Notice the parallel between the two atoms. We were ruined by our first representative. We had nothing to do with that. So there's nothing strange that we can be redeemed through our second representative. We have nothing to do with that. By the sin of one, Adam, condemnation came on the whole race. By the righteousness, the atoning death of one, acquittal, justification, came upon just as many. The whole race has been redeemed. The whole human race was in Christ's tomb. The Roman soldiers didn't know that. The whole human race was on the cross. If one died for all, then all died. 2 Corinthians 5.14. Wonderful news. By life I didn't live. By death I didn't die. I can claim eternity. Mine are Christ living and dying as I had lived his life and died his death, said Martin Luther. Mine. Mine. That's why the New Testament says that we are crucified with Christ. Galatians 2.20 We're buried with him. Romans chapter 6. We rose with him. Colossians 3 and verse 1. And then we're seated with him in heavenly places. Ephesians 2.6. Don't look within. Look at him. That's what changes us. For every look at the wound, ten looks at the physician. Romans 5. The climax to the section on justification is saying, the whole world's been justified. Please receive it. Then it moves into the beginnings of sanctification. Chapter 6. I'm going to read to you now from chapter 6. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Please notice, modern translations don't say we who are dead to sin, but we who died to it. That's correct. Eleven times in this chapter you have the aorist tense, which means a, a single act done. We're not dead to sin. You and I still tremble and vibrate when temptation comes. I do every day. But I did die to it in Christ. And God is saying, consider the indicative and the imperative. The indicative is you died with Christ. The imperative is mortify your members. The indicative is you've been clothed with his righteousness. The imperative is put on therefore the Lord Jesus Christ. It's the now and the not yet. In the merciful reckoning of God, I died with Christ. So I've got to act that way. I've got to act like a man who's been dead and raised again. Therefore all the old slave masters have no right over me. When temptation comes, I respond to the knock and say, sorry, that man no longer lives here, he died. Or that woman no longer lives here, she died. We who died to sin, we can't live in it any longer. You see, chapter 6 is saying, sin remains but it cannot reign. If I took you up to the St. Lawrence River in Canada when the thaw was well advanced, I'd say, look, the dominion of the ice is broken. You'd say, dead, it's not. There's a bit of ice, there's a bit of ice, there's a bit of ice. Ah, I say, the thaw has set in. The dominion of the ice is broken. Ice remains, but it doesn't dominate the river anymore. That's why it, us, it is with us with sin. Sin does remain in the believer. Not conscious, willful, rebellious sin. No, no, no. The sins we trip into, sins we hate. The Bible makes a distinction between presumptuous sin and sins of weakness. The Christian doesn't do the first. When John said in 1 John 3.15 that the believer has no sin, he was talking about presumptuous sins. Because later on in the last chapter he talks about if you see a brother sin a sin. So brothers in Christ do sin. John, in the last chapter of his epistle, talks about the difference between mortal sins and sins that are not mortal. It is the high-handed, deliberate course of rebellion that separates us from Christ. We can't do that. Every Christian's free from that while looking to Jesus. But all Christians stumble and fall short, but there's no condemnation. So sin remains, but it does not reign in the life. I'm reading on. Verse 6, we know our old self was crucified with him so the sinful body might be destroyed, that we might no longer be enslaved to sin. He who has died is freed from sin. Do you want to know how to overcome your besetting sins? Count yourself dead to them. And so long as you count it, it is so. 
Look back at the cross. You were there when he died. Your sinful nature died with him. Count it so, and it is so. This is the way to victory over besetting sins. Read these verses in the Living Bible. Read them in a dozen different translations till you get the message. God counts us dead. We're to count ourselves dead. So in these verses of Romans 6, Paul is telling us to reckon, to consider. Verse 11, you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal bodies to make you obey their passions. Please notice, we still have passions. I'll still hammer on the coffin lid. Let me out. For where to deny them? Don't yield your members to sin. Yield yourselves to God. Notice verse 14. Sin will have no dominion over you since you're not under law but under grace. That's a beautiful verse. Notice it doesn't say sin won't have dominion over you because you know the Ten Commandments because you recite them every day. It says sin won't have dominion over you when you realize your salvation depends on what Christ did by his sinless life and his atoning death. When you see that grace, gift, the words are related. When you see that, then sin has no rule over you. Can't charm you anymore. You've found something far more charming, Christ and his gospel. You become free when you see God accepts you freely on the basis of Christ's work for you, already accomplished at Calvary. Then sin won't dominate your life anymore. And now we're going to look briefly at the seventh chapter. You know, Romans 1 to 5 tell us we're free from the wrath of God because of the cross, because of justification. Romans 6 tells us we are free from the reign of sin. Romans 7 is going to tell us we're free from the law as a method, never free from it as a standard. When we get to Romans 8, it'll tell us we're free from death. Chapter 6 says, you died to sin and you're alive to God. Chapter 7 says, you're now married to Christ. And the old man who was submitted to the law has died. Chapter 8 will say, you're free from the captivity of the flesh because you're led by the Holy Spirit. You've died to the flesh and now you will truly live. So we're in seven. And I want to particularly look at the most debated section, beginning at verse 14. We know the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. I don't understand my own actions. I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. Now if I do what I do not want, I agree the law is good. So then it's no longer I that do it, but sin that dwells within me. For I know that nothing good dwells within me, that is in my flesh. I can will what is right, but I can't do it. If I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I do. Now if I do what I do not want, it's no longer I that do it, but sin that dwells within me. So I find it to be a law that when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. I delight in the law of God, my inmost self, but I see in my members another law, at war with the law of my mind, making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. And never forget the next verse in, at the beginning of Romans 8. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ. The real purpose of chapter 7 is to tell us that the law that can't justify us, also can't sanctify us. It's not enough. The law is a schoolmaster to bring us to Christ that we might be justified by faith. It's not the saviour. But it's often debated whether these verses 14 to 25 mean a unbeliever, a carnal believer, or a very mature Christian. Calvin, 
and I think the greatest theologians of the church have believed the last one. Why? Why do they think it applies to a true believer? How can it when it talks about what I would I do not, what I would not that I do? This man's view of duty is so high, his standards are so lofty, that the slightest diminution of achievement fills him with self-hatred. This is not the language of a man who's committing adultery or stealing. It's a man who knows he doesn't pray enough, doesn't love enough, isn't grateful enough, and feels bad accordingly. So let me tell you why I think this applies to the converted spiritual man. It's in the present tense, the preceding verses in the chapter about the past tense, when it talks about Paul's experience before conversion, when it says in uh, verse 10 of this chapter 7, he says, um, he says, I was alive without the law, the commandment came and sin revived and I died, and the commandment that promised life proved to be death unto me. And back in verse 7, is the law sin? No, if it hadn't been for the law, I hadn't have known sin. I wouldn't have known what it is to covet if the law hadn't said you shall not covet. So the early verses in the past tense talk about his experience before conversion. Now it slips into the second, uh, the, the second section slips into the present tense. Wretched man that I am. He's been 14 years a Christian. You hardly hear of most of those years, by the way. It's as though God trains us in obscurity before he can use us publicly. But it's the present tense. And it's the first person it's Paul saying it. The present tense, the first person. And notice it's someone who's in love with the law of God and that the sinner is not, nor the carnal Christian. I delight in the law of God. Furthermore, this is in the section on sanctification. Chapters 6, 7 and 8 deal with being made holy. It's not the section that leads up to it. Like chapters 1 and 2 and the first part of 3. And lastly, there's nothing in these verses inconsistent with other descriptions of the Christian life. For example, in Galatians 5.17 says the flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh, so you cannot do the things that you would. So here's a battle still going on in every believer's heart. The flesh tugs and tugs and tugs, and the spirit's got to overrule it. If you walk according to the spirit, you'll not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. They're still there, dear friends. The lusts of the flesh don't die, but we're counted dead in the merciful reckoning of God. And then in 1 Corinthians 9, in the last verses, Paul says, I run not as uncertainly, I fight not as one beating the air, I keep under my body, lest having preached to others, I should become a castaway. So there's nothing inconsistent with other descriptions of the Christian life in the New Testament with these verses. They are wonderfully encouraging. If we don't understand these verses, we'll have defeats and despair and discouragement and doubts. These verses tell us the Christian is often taxed terribly because he feels, or she feels, they fall so far short of the ideal that they cherish. But every time in this passage, the will is directed to the good. And the use of the expression, no longer I, shows it's not the old Paul, it's the converted man. And cherish indeed the beginning of chapter 8. There's now no condemnation to them that are in Christ. This is why chapter 7 finished with an apparent dichotomy. I myself serve the law of God with my mind, but with my flesh I serve the law of sin. He's saying the battle's still on, but there's no condemnation. Isn't that great? You and I may lose battles, but we'll win the war. So in summary, what have we said? We're free from the wrath of God, Romans 1 to 5. We're free from the reign of sin, chapter 6. We're free from law as a method, chapter 7. And soon we're going to see in chapter 8 that we're free from death. Now I want to stress that all these chapters towards the end tell us how we're free. At the end of chapter 5, it can tell us through Jesus Christ our Lord. When we come to the end of chapter 6, through Jesus Christ our Lord. When we're in chapter 7, you'll notice he says in verse 25, through Jesus Christ our Lord. And when finally we come to chapter 8, the last words are, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Dear friend, never look to yourself. I find my constant temptation is when I'm in a difficult situation is to look to myself for resources. This is folly, it's poor theology, and it never works. Everything has gotten through Jesus Christ our Lord. When I know my weakness, 
when I'm in deep trouble or in deep temptation, if I look to Jesus, he will do for me and in me exceedingly abundantly above all that I can ask or think. Isn't that a blessed gospel? God bless you.